This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Paul Boyer, Brad, and Kevin. Coming up on DTNS, part two of our discussion of what the heck Apple's product announcement strategy is these days, plus how Firefox is helping ad blockers. And are we still feeling okay about TikTok? How do we go? This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, January 18th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Oh, lovely to be back with you all again, isn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. It is. No, well, you say I'm, that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I say that now. Well, let's just find out what's in the quick hits first. <laughs> Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella informed employees that the company will cut 10,000 jobs by March. That's about 5% of its workforce. Unclear where Microsoft will be making the cut specifically, but this does mark the company's second largest round of layoffs in its history after cutting 18,000 jobs back in 2014, with many cuts at that time tied to its Nokia business. But... It's not just Microsoft. After announcing more impending layoffs earlier this month, Amazon continues to eliminate more jobs as well. The cuts started last year, particularly hitting Amazon's devices and services group. The latest round is said to mostly affect Amazon's retail division, human resources, and added to previous rounds, will end up totaling around 18,000 positions lost, the largest job cuts in Amazon's history. All right, so that's kind of a bummer, but this one's good. Samsung expanded its self-repair program program to include laptops for the first time. So it's now offering parts and repair guides for the 15-inch Galaxy Book Pro and Galaxy Book Pro 360. It also added the Galaxy S22 smartphone line to the program. Twitter launched annual subscriptions for its Twitter Blue service, so users can purchase these on the web for $84 per year. It's 12% less than paying monthly on the web, or 36% less than a monthly iOS subscription. New revenue is important for Twitter, as the information sources say that Twitter's daily revenue as of January 17th was down 40% from the same day a year ago, with more than 500 advertisers pausing spending on the site. Now, perhaps Twitter will make more than expected from its auction of various office items, which ended Wednesday. Ah, I missed out on that Ames desk. Uh, Discord has acquired a four-member team behind Gas, a social media app aimed at teens. We, t- we talked about this uh, a while ago in DTNS. Users sign up for Gas by school, so I wasn't able to test it out because I don't go to a school. Uh, then you add friends, and you answer poll questions that are intended to boost your confidence. So users selected in a poll would get an anonymous message with a compliment and a vague detail like, this came from a girl in 11th grade. Discord said that that, quote, gas will continue as its own standalone app, and the gas team will be joining Discord to help our efforts to continue to grow across new and core audiences. Norwegian shipping register DNV confirmed that its ship manager software system was infected by ransomware on January 7th, forcing it to shut down its servers. DNV's ship manager lets its customers monitor operational, technical, and compliance features of a shipping fleet. So things like repairs, crew schedules, and other record keeping. TechCrunch said more than 7,000 vessels used the software, but that 1,000 vessels had actually been affected. Affected ships can continue to use onboard offline functions of the software. DNV says that it's confident its servers were not affected, but has not determined if any data was actually compromised. Yeah, and I I actually, uh, thanks to Big Jim for for helping me understand this story. Uh, Depending on what data may or may not be compromised uh, will depend on whether this is a pretty big deal or not. Uh, So there you go. All right, let's talk a little more about what's going on with ad blocking. Let's do it. So RW Nash pointed out in our subreddit, and thanks for this, by the way, that The Verge has a story called Firefox found a way to keep ad blockers working with Manifest V3. Firefox 109 released Tuesday with support for Manifest V3, also known as MV3, a standard for browser extensions. The short version is that Mozilla is following through on a promise to update its support for extensions, but in a way that doesn't harm how certain ad blockers work. 
Here's a little bit more that you need to understand the story, Tom. Yeah, so a manifest in this particular case uh, is a file format. Uh, it includes a bunch of info. Yeah, what browser version this extension works with, how long it's been around, and it defines what browser features an extension can access. Manifest version two, or MV2, allowed an extension to load code from a remote server. So an ad blocker, for instance, could update some definitions as it went. Uh, it could also access a feature called web request. That might ring a bell if you listened to our discussion last June. Ad blockers use that feature to block traffic to and from domains known to serve ads. And some ad blockers, like Ghostry, for example, also modify data that could be used to fingerprint you and replace it with generic data in order to further protect your privacy from ad tracking. Now, ad blockers use those features for the purpose of blocking ads, of course. That makes sense. However, malicious extensions could take advantage of MV2 to hijack login credentials or insert more ads into the page. That's no fun. Like any software function, it can be misused. So monitoring extensions is important. However, it's a whole lot easier to just change things so that misuse isn't actually possible. That's what Google pushed for MV3. Yeah, so they replaced web request with declarative net request. That's the feature that lets you still block domains. You just have to say which ones you're going to block ahead of time. You, you have to you have to list them. Ghostry's attempt to block fingerprint has to happen at runtime, so it could not be declared ahead of time, and that and some other things would no longer work well under declarative net request. Now, if you were following the story, there was a lot of noise around this last summer, but here's what happened. Mozilla promised to come up with a way to support MV3 and also continue to support web request. That's what it pushed out in Firefox 109. This lets extensions like Ghostry and others continue to work as usual in Firefox while also taking advantage of the rest of MV3. Also makes it easier for developers to design a multi-platform extension that can work in Chrome and also Firefox. Yeah, so Firefox has done what it said it was gonna do as of right now. Google, on the other hand, seems to have blinked. It originally set summer 2023 as the deadline, end of support for MV2. However, Ghostery and other extensions have not updated their Chrome extensions to support MV3. On December 9th, Google said, ah, uh, that timeline for getting rid of MV2 is now under review and experiments that would test what happens if you turned MV2 off have now been delayed. So as of this moment, you can still do web request as an ad blocking extension and get all the stuff from MV3. It's all in both browsers. So here's here's my, my initial question. I, I, I think I have my head wrapped around how this actually works, but... How much does Google really care that some third party ad blocker is not, uh, you know, up updating its side of the bargain to work well with MV3? Because they don't want the backlash, right? A bunch of users mm. of Chrome suddenly go, wait, why doesn't Ghostery work? And Ghostery says, because. Chrome did an update, talk to Google. And they they also don't want to have bad developer relations with Ghostry and others too. Sure. I think, you know, they'd, they'd rather come to an agreement of some sort. So I feel like that's that's why they've, they've backed down. They, they've been sort of forced into it. Such a tricky relationship because on the one hand, um, you know, Google continues to be an ad serving juggernaut. It's a huge primary part of their business. And on the other hand, they, they can't be seen or even actively do things that that get in the way of this kind of stuff because if yeah. they do then they're accused of all sorts of malfeasance and you know those who are trying to do i mean but i get it like i, I get why it's a weird relationship because they would like us to never block an ad again <laughs> if we could help it they don't want malicious ads they and, don't want and honestly codes. i think the chrome the chrome folks are fine with ad blocking they're just trying to strike a balance because they've got some internal pressures like you like you say yeah well, a day after its M2 chip and refreshed Mac line announcements, Apple said, <laughs> we're not done. We're going to announce a second gen HomePod speaker, which adds an S7 processor previously used in the Apple Watch 7, thread radios, and also support for Matter. Also has an active temperature uh, and humidity sensor for smart home automations. And a software update in the spring will let it listen for smoke or carbon monoxide alarms. Now, like the original HomePod, it can be used in a stereo pair with another home pod of the same model, which is important, and as speakers for the Apple TV. Available for pre-order now for $299, shipping February 9th. 
So you're like, wait a minute. Do you you talked about Apple stuff yesterday? We did. Uh, we we talked about those MacBooks and if this was going to be a new way of announcing products uh, for Apple, or if this is all just them scrambling because of supply chain problems and a delayed mixed reality headset. The mixed reality headset is still expected to launch this year, but Bloomberg's Mark Gurman's sources say Apple will delay the launch of a follow-up pair of lightweight augmented reality glasses. So there's going to be the first gen, and then they were going to do a lightweight version after that. Instead, Apple is going to follow that first gen with a lower cost version of the first gen sometime in 2024 or possibly early 2025. Gurman claims that Apple's first mixed reality headset will cost around $3,000 and use one of those M2 processors, while the follow-up headset would use a lower power, probably A series iPhone processor and cost around half the amount, still 1500 bucks. So let, let's pick up where we left off with Nika Monford and Rich Straffolino on Tuesday. Given these two new pieces of the puzzle, dropping a new HomePod the day after you announced the new laptops and these leaks about a mixed reality headset timeline change. Scott, what do you think Apple's product strategy is? Well, it seems different than usual. I will say that. It's hard to say whether this is a long-term plan or not. Maybe supply chain still plays a role in how this is happening. But clearly they said, these things which are normally good mentions at a bigger event, we don't need to have Tim Cook get up and do that. We don't need to go film a special thing for it. We can just put it out there. And that's not to say they haven't done this in the past with smaller, more low-level uh, you know, product increases like, oh, this uh, MacBook got a little extra RAM. Well, of course, they're not going to do, you know, a full stage presentation for that MacBook RAM upgrade. But them doing this for, I think, reasonably uh, higher level products, higher higher interest products uh, is a change. It's a sea change. And I don't know if it means they're going to keep doing it or not. We'll have to wait and see if there's a second time. But I think it's great. I think save your huge stuff like your mixed reality headsets that are reportedly coming or your next big phone changes or whatever, save those for your big events, but make more room during the year for exciting new announcements. I have to admit, I got excited about the new HomePod, even though I thought the first one was overpriced and not something for me. Things have changed. And I'm more interested in that device than I was before. And I'm certainly interested in the M2 upgrades from yesterday. So they were kind of nice. I don't feel like I have to wait until the next WWDC or I have to wait till the next fall update or whatever. I can actually hear this stuff happening more quickly. And they kind of got me with it. I can't speak for everybody else, but it feels like good timing. Yeah, I think if the HomePod was bundled into yesterday's announcements, it would have been a little bit more buried. So this mm -hmm. makes sense to say, like, it's HomePod day. That said... The HomePod in general has always been a little confusing to me. You know, when it was first released, I think it was $349. Everybody said, well, it sure looks nice. And Apple's touting, you know, it's the, you know, the best audio experience ever, you know, and, and you've got, you know, Siri in a smart speaker, you know, in an Apple product at home. And, you know, it, it wasn't like a runaway hit. A lot of people said, well, I mean, you're a little late to the game, Apple. You're more expensive than everybody else. And, you know, a lot of people just have already figured out other alternatives. And the HomePod sort of just went away. Got You had the HomePod mini, but for the most part, the HomePod was kind of like, kind of a dud in general. It's back, it's a little bit cheaper. The specs are more or less the same. There's some new kind of fun stuff, but they've also pulled back a tiny bit on some of the, um, you know, like there's a, a two fewer tweeters than the original HomePod, for example. Some people will care about that, other people won't. But uh, yeah, I, I kind of wonder why Apple is more or less making it seem like we've got this new product, but it's sort of the same. Product. Thread. Thread is the answer to that. Well, uh, because sure. Because yeah. Apple is always late and always more expensive but sometimes that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, and it mattered with the HomePod. And that that is the question of like, well, why, why did it matter? And I think part of the reason was these things are used for two things, playing music and controlling your smart home. Uh, and, and, and basically people didn't want to do either one of those with the home pod. They were either listening to Spotify too much, uh, or they were using smart home devices that weren't compatible. Putting thread in here suddenly makes it so that you can easily control anything and you can switch from using an echo or a Google or a nest home, uh, to, to controlling your smart home. So I think they're, they're giving it another shot there. 
If I were Apple, I know Apple will never do this. I'd be advertising the fact that you can play Spotify on this thing, and suddenly you're going to sell a bunch more of them. Yeah, could they, if they push just Apple Music, I think that'd be a mistake. But but it's funny because my decision about possibly picking one of these up has to do with that very thing. I've used uh, I've been in the Echo ecosystem for a very long time, and those Amazon devices have been fine. But I found that all I use them for is music, and I use them for Apple Music. Funny enough, but I don't use them for shopping or checking lists or doing to dos or any of the other stuff they always suggest that I might want to do. I never do it, and so. If they're telling me a very nice sounding device that's a little more in my ecosystem and a little bit cheaper this time around, I'm just suddenly in the market. And I think maybe they know that about uh, maybe enough people or they have market research that says people are kind of bored with their echoes. Maybe it's mm. time for a change. Not to yeah. leave Google out of this thing because obviously they got a, an important role to play here in this market. But for whatever reason, I'm more interested in that thing now. And it's really mostly music. And that's kind of it. And I think I think this product announcement strategy to get back to that part of the question uh, is is a natural evolution because of, well, we would have preferred to announce this in the autumn, but it would have been too far ahead of time because we can't source the parts for it. And then it becomes, well, do we wait till March when we, we usually do an announcement? No, we can sell them now and we might as well start selling them now. So let's get some spotlight on them and sell them, as, as you noticed with both the laptops yesterday and the HomePod today, available for pre-order immediately. Immediately shipping in a couple of weeks. So there's not a lot of yeah. delay uh, on the stuff. I think Apple is just going to use that to say, yeah, if we've got an iPhone, we're going to do a live announcement and build up a lot of uh, stuff around it. But if, if, if the timing of the products is different, maybe it's better. They, they may look at this and say, we sold more HomePods because we gave it its own day and it drafted off of a MacBook Pro announcement. We're, we don't have to pretend like we're replicating Macworld keynotes anymore, which is really what those those regular live streams have been doing for years. And I, I, I expect we'll see more of that. Uh, folks, what do you want to hear us talk about on the show? One way to let us know is in our subreddit, uh, as we mentioned earlier on with that Firefox story. You can submit your stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. TikTok announced Wednesday it will expand its labeling of state-controlled media posts. So the, that label is used on videos published by an account that is, and I quote, subject to control or influence by a government. TikTok has labeled such posts in Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus since last year, and will now expand that label to more than 40 markets. Uh, and among those markets are China, the UK, and the US. TikTok, obviously owned by ByteDance, which is incorporated in the Cayman Islands and headquartered in Beijing. There have been a parade of controversies around TikTok's handling of data going back to 2020. Um, you may have strong feelings about this yourself. TikTok itself is headquartered in Santa Monica, California, with data services, data servers rather, for U.S. users in Singapore and also the U.S., However, as many of you know, you don't have to live in the same country as a server in order to access that server's data. And there have been a lot of stories with many varying le levels of accuracy about when and how ByteDance employees in China have potentially accessed U.S. user account information. In fact, last June, TikTok moved its U.S. data entirely to the U.S. on servers maintained by Oracle. Well, that has not stopped the concerns, as hmm. you may have noticed. Several U.S. states and the U.S. House of Representatives have blocked TikTok from being accessed on their networks. And Tuesday, the University of Texas at Austin announced it will not allow users to access TikTok when connected to university internet servers. Several other Texas universities have followed suit. So it might be a good time for us to go around the table. Have our personal feelings changed about TikTok? Sarah, you and I talked a bunch about how it's sort of a place we like going and the algorithm knows us and we sort of get the entertainment we're looking for. Is that still true for you? I've kind of come full circle. So TikTok was a big thing before I ever even downloaded the app. I was like, eh, yeah, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I I have too many time wasting things in my life already. But once I you know, enough uh, folks started to send me funny TikTok videos that they thought I would like, and I, I okay, I I signed up for an account. I don't post anything. I'm I'm just consuming uh, a, a, a fun content. And I I was like many others really impressed with the algorithm in a scary way. <laughs> I'm impressed with it because it's just a really intense algorithm that seemed to know me 
even better than other algorithms, uh, the, uh, you know, of, of, I don't know, like the Instagrams or the or the, or the Twitters or the Facebooks or whatever. And for a while, I was, I was very on the TikTok train. I have just lost interest. Uh, and a lot of that is just because so much of the content is designed to just grab my eyeballs. Yeah, you know, it's whether it's dance video or farm animals or things that the algorithm knows that I will like, it just tends to derail my life too much if I spend too much time on TikTok. So that's really just so it works too fatigue. well. Is that what you're yeah. saying? It works it too well. Works yeah, too well. exactly. And it's so like, you're like I can't, I can't handle it. Yeah, it's I'll like if I have ice cream day. in the house, I'm going to eat it. It's kind of mm -hmm. better if I just don't have ice cream in the house. But that doesn't really have much to do with how fearful I am about TikTok and nefarious ways that mm -hmm. it is collecting my data. I'm not saying that that's not a concern. I know people are very concerned about that, and particularly, uh, you know, a variety of universities saying it's just better if TikTok is not part of at least, you know, our 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 school servers. I get that. I don't have a a, a, a huge issue with it myself. Yeah, I want yeah. to say that uh, locally, just as an anecdotal thing, there are local high school uh, has banned the use of this thing on on the high school campus. However, they're not doing it at a server le server level. They're just doing an honor system where they're telling kids, "Don't let us catch you with TikTok running on your phone," and they're doing it for distraction reasons. But you know, mm -hmm. their 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 controversy doesn't just start and end with TikTok being. A security issue it's also an issue for a lot of parents a lot of teachers a lot of people think it's too distracting too much time on there and this just adds to that i guess yeah i'm i'm not overly concerned with the chinese government getting information about me from tiktok partially because i always am aware that a company could be collecting data about me and so i'm in the habit of of acting differently <laughs> in that way uh, i also think there, there's a little bit of China fear out there that's like, oh, everything. China, China doesn't care that much about TikTok. That said, uh, I wouldn't be shocked if there were some psyops stuff that was uncovered, but it's probably not targeted at me. Uh, so I, I think ByteDance in particular doesn't strike me as as a company that you know, is going to cooperate as much uh, as some other companies. I also am aware that every single company, including Microsoft and Amazon that operate in China, have to operate with a data sharing agreement with some other Chinese based company. So there's always opportunities for data leaking over there. Uh, I, I don't think there's zero concern, but I think the concern is often exaggerated because China uh, in a way that that really isn't warranted. Uh, that said, uh, I, I, I do do, uh, you know, I, I restrict what I what I look at on TikTok and, and I, I tend to get um, a lot of K-pop dances. That That's really what I see. Yeah, I do, too. And I wonder, Sarah, if that that thing about sort of losing interest, um, if you're good enough in an algorithm. They've gotten part A of the algorithm problem figured out, which is give them the stuff that they want and we know that they want. Now the trick is, what do we give Sarah that she doesn't yet know she wants, yeah, right? Exactly. And I don't know any app that can do that. And maybe TikTok's the first to try or attempt it. And maybe that makes them look bad as the guy. No, these all these apps stuff, do that. But... All these apps do that. YouTube does that. TikTok does that. It's just a matter of whether they do it in a way that works. If you've ever looked at your YouTube recommendations list and said, why is that there? Why is there a Pat Benatar video there? Uh, it's because <laughs> it's trying that. It's trying. It's just they're not that good at it yet. Right. I love that you picked that one, though. I just want to point out. <laughs> That's actually an example from Eileen. Eileen keeps getting Pat Benatar. She's like, why is that there? I'm like, it's trying. It thinks it knows something about you that it doesn't. <laughs> mm -hmm. I well, and I, 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 you know, to go back to TikTok's algorithm, for a while I was like, this is amazing. I mean, sure, every once in a while I'd get a funny video where I'd be like, why is that there? Oh, it's because so-and-so sent me something that was relevant enough that it thinks... Maybe I want to see, I don't know, like this video of a parade that isn't actually very relevant to me. But but yeah, it's 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 that social media fatigue. I, you know, I, there's only so many like ha ha funny things I can see or, uh, you know, somebody ranting about something. It, it, yeah. it starts to just all feel the same to me after a while. Well, what doesn't feel the same uh, to me is Boston <laughs> Dynamics Humanoid Robot Atlas, <laughs> because Atlas, uh, if you're not familiar, um, is a pretty cool robot, bipedal, uh, has a few new tricks up its sleeve, though. The robot could already run and jump on uneven surfaces, 
but can now pick things up, drop things off, even throw things with its new hands. Now, they're not really hands, they're more like claws. There's one fixed finger and one moving finger, so you can kind of touch and grab and, and pull. Boston Dynamics says that this will let Atlas literally do heavy lifting, though. You could move construction lumber, for example. Maybe move or throw a bag of tools. The company describes Atlas' new pickup and throw skills in a demo video, which is really worth watching, by the way, we'll have it in our show notes. And explains it, describes it as an inverted 540 degree multi axis flip, adding asymmetry to the robot's movement, making it a much more difficult skill than previously performed parkour. Atlas, still a research platform. So if you're saying, I want this robot, this is going to be my new best friend, you can't buy one, at least not yet. Yeah, these, these are always just demos to get everybody talking about it, like we're doing right now, uh, because then Boston Dynamics hopes that when they do roll out a product, which is going to be for warehouses and enterprise use, uh, that, that folks who are in, power, in purchasing positions uh, have heard about it and get excited and want to buy it. Yeah. I want one. So do I. <laughs> I mean, I don't. People, I've said, I said this on Twitter earlier, and somebody said, You're crazy. This is all they need to do is get so sentient they decide your family isn't important anymore and you guys are done. I get the whole, you know, robot phobic <laughs> world we've built yeah, for ourselves yeah, with science yeah. fiction. It's all fine. What I'm saying is that thing looks like it can lift a lot of things and not break its back doing it. And if I had an extra, probably many millions of dollars those things cost, then I would probably get one if I had money to, to waste. Why not? Yeah. I have to say the uh, the walking uh, really does look like a person in a suit now instead yeah. of a robot, which is yeah. either a conspiracy yeah, theory lurch. or impressive. Yeah, there's less sort of like, okay, I get it, you're kind of walking, and more of like a, hmm, that is pretty human-like. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. There will be conspiracies about this video because it is freaky, and he's too excited about the work he's doing. Wait, you think the internet will have a, a wide enough reach that someone will create a conspiracy theory? About I think something? it's possible, Tom. I think mm. it's possible. I'm not saying it's likely. <laughs> think about it. I think it's possible. I don't know. You yeah. I don't know. You, got, you, you're all being very pessimistic. Humans aren't like that. No, of course not. <laughs> Nothing like that. No. No. Uh, Humans, however, uh, can uh, get in trouble when they face big cars. We've been talking about that since Friday. Uh, let's check out the mailbag, shall yeah. we? Let's do it. So Bodhi, uh, who we spoke to on Friday about this very topic, wanted to follow up on our follow-up on Tuesday's show from last Friday's show about vehicle weight and pedestrian safe safety in particular. Bodhi's uh, had some really good info from Trinity College Dublin professor Dr. Ciaran Sims that when designing a vehicle for pedestrian safety in particular, important factors are shape and stiffness of the vehicle. Sim also states that, quote, vehicle mass makes very little difference be because all humans are much lighter than cars, end quote. Based on his simulations, a low-fronted vehicle like a sedan is going to do less damage than a high-fronted vehicle like an SUV. Bodhi also included video of Dr. Sims giving a talk on the subject at Ignite Dublin, which will be in our show notes as well. Bodhi uh, had some other notes. Um, uh, among them, scientists are researching how to make accidents safer for both vehicle occupants and pedestrians. They're always doing that. Manufacturers are doing some things to make pedestrians safer in the event of an accident, but they could do better. Bodhi says it's not really a sexy feature. I mean, when is a car salesman going to tell a potential customer how safe the vehicle is for a pedestrian if you happen to hit somebody? <laughs> yeah. uh, you usually just sort of avoid that topic. Uh, Bodhi says prevention is important, uh, just as important as mitigation. Um, he notes Rob Dunwood's uh, note from Friday's show that some vehicle safety systems detect pedestrians already, and that's true. Bodhi says over time, these systems are just going to get better. They're going to be available for a while wider range of vehicles. And finally, Bodhi says, we need to rethink or at least reevaluate our city's infrastructure and local laws to provide a safer environment for pedestrians. It's all I'm, one big ecosystem. I'm still waiting for someone to find the peer reviewed, you know, actual rigorous uh, analysis of this. Uh, Bodhi provided uh, that that lecture from a Trinity College professor uh, and the N NHTSA uh, stuff, which is good. Uh, but this all makes sense to me as well. And, and Bodhi works in, you know, in, in the industry. So uh, he, he kind of knows uh, about these sort of safety issues. And it makes sense to me that there are so many other things we can do to protect pedestrians. Uh, and he backs up 
up what I suspected yesterday is a lot of those SUV studies have to do with the fact that it's it's a high SUV uh, versus the actual weight of the SUV. So mm-hmm. it's it's uh, it's good info. Thank you, Bodie, for following up on that. I really appreciate it. Indeed. Turn into a really good conversation. Also, thanks to you, Scott Johnson, for being with us today. Let folks know where they can keep up with your latest. Well, sure. Uh, I would just point them to frogpants.com, which has a link to all the podcasts I host. And uh, there's something there for everybody. So go dig around, see what you like. There's also some artwork there, uh, progress on my board game that, or my card game that I'm working on. A whole bunch of fun stuff. If you uh, want to see some creativity on display and wonder how many hours I have in my day, it's a good place to start. Go to uh, frogpants.com and check it out. We also want to extend a special thanks to Daniel. Daniel is one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. We have quite a few Daniels who are our patrons of ours, but you know who you are, Daniel. Thank you for all the years of support. Patrons, stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet. We roll right into it when DTNS rolls, wraps up, rather. You can also catch our show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow with Justin Robert Young joining us. Don't miss it. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this broker. <laughs>